Our opening uh, keynote for today, Fork in the Road. Throughout history, geography and natural resources played a pivotal role in the fall and rise of great empires. In the knowledge economy, education is the key to success of an individual, a company, and a country. India is at an inflection point, and now the question is whether it will replicate the success of Singapore or if it will fall to its challenges. Here to discuss these issues is our fearless leader, co-founder and CEO of GSV, Michael Mo. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know how fearless I am. I'm a little bit intimidated right now, but um, anyway, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's great to be in India. And I want to, on behalf of my colleagues at GSV and our partners at Emeritus, just want to thank you for being here. We just uh, greatly appreciate your involvement. And we are very excited about what's already happened yesterday and what's going to happen the next couple of days. So the name of the conference is All Eyes on India. And the t my talk is about Fork in the Road because we really are I believe an inflection point in terms of what this opportunity can be as we look at the future for India and really for society overall. But before I get into my comments, so as, as Deborah mentioned, Anita mentioned, you, you know, GSV from the very beginning, uh, what our mission has been is to give everybody an equal opportunity to participate in the future, the foundation of which is access to quality education and knowledge as Mother Teresa said, a life not lived for others is a life um, not, not a life lived. And what we really believe is we can get everything we want if we help enough people get what they want. So back up about 5,000 years, a little historical context. Throughout history, uh, the you know, great empires rose and fell to their, uh, really due to their geographic and natural resources. So over the last 5,000 years, there's been two, 22 global empires. We had the Egyptian empire that lasted for just over a thousand years. You had writing, you had irrigation, you had clocks that came from it. The Zhao dynasty, which is 800 years, crossbows, horseback riding. The Roman empire, which lasted just over a thousand years, cement, aqueducts, highways, coins, all were part of that empire. Then the Han dynasty was about 400 years, paper, deep drilling. The Ottoman Empire, which lasted about 600 years, you had surgery, mathematics, physics. The British Empire, which the saying was the, the, the sun never set on the British Empire because they spanned the globe. You had the telegraph, railways, and steamships. And then really for the last 100 years, it's been the American century. And the American century certainly benefited from geographic and natural uh, resources but it was a different formula that was really focused on ideas, entrepreneurship, education. It prioritized entrepreneurship, innovation, education, immigration, and equal opportunity for all. We call that E-I-E-I-O. But we had an entrepreneurship, we, the, the airplane with Orville and Wilbur Wright, the car, the PC, the internet. Innovation, the iPhone, the, the electric car, Tesla. In education, in 1965, the United States had the best education system in the world, best universities, best high schools with the highest graduation rates, best gra graduation for rates in terms of percentage of the population in college. And when you look at immigration, you know, even today, over 50% of the unicorns were started by immigrants. You know, just an example of that, the PayPal mafia, which has become notorious, of the 13 founders at PayPal, and obviously PayPal was very successful in its own right, eight were from outside the United States and went on to form over a trillion dollars of businesses, including YouTube, Tesla, LinkedIn, and many, many others. So the United States 40th president, Ronald Reagan, said, you can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you can't become a German, a Turk, or a Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. And that was really the inspiration 
that really drove a lot of the opportunity that was created. And then the American dream, whether you were from the United States, you came to the United States, you came here because you had this idea that it didn't matter who your parents were, it didn't matter where you went to school, if you had the ambition, you had the guts, the drive, there was no limit to what you could achieve. And that was really uh, what, what propelled the American century and was, was quite exciting. Halfway across the globe, a little teeny island, Singapore, we had just become an independent state in 1965. And in that year, um, another island that basically had no natural resources either, Jamaica, they both had effectively the same GDP per capita. And then, as uh, the Pablo Picasso said, good artists copy, but great artists steal, which Steve Jobs also made that comment. And in Singapore, their leader, their fa the father of the country, Lee Kuan Yew, basically looked at that EIEIO formula and grabbed it for Singapore, focused on entrepreneurship, innovation, education, and creating equal opportunity for all. And from that, Singapore went from being a poor little country to the wealthiest country almost in the, in the, in the world, or GDP per capita, you know, effectively uh, crushing Jamaica over that you know, period of time. And looking and compared to the United States, which, which in 1965 was at 22,000 versus the 500, you fast forward the clock to today, and Singapore is actually above where the United States is. So what was the magic, as I said before, E-I-E-I-O. And you know, then looking what happened is this, this uh, great nation of China came up and looked effectively at what was happening at Singapore. <clears throat> And Lee Kuan Yew and Xi Jinping met in 1978, and I call it the handshake that shook the world because basically um, they met 33 times in the upcoming couple decades, and China effectively borrowed that playbook from Singapore and applied it to a country of 1.4 billion people. And in 1978, when that handshake occurred, India and China had effectively the same uh, GDP per capita, India slightly larger. Then, of course, what's happened over that period of time, you know, China has grown tremendously. I mean, India has grown too, but China has, you know, has, has grown its GDP per capita in an extraordinary way, uh, taking 770 million Chinese out of poverty. In 1978, they had 96% of their population was, was, was in poverty. Today, it's less than 1%. And you know, part of that was that focus on the one child policy, six adults for every child, and they could focus those, those, that, that one child to really have that child have its full opportunity and focus really on education. So you look in 1978, only 1% of the Chinese uh, population that, that graduated from high school went to college. Today, that's 64%. And China invested in the future in terms of strategic uh, connectivity around the world, the One Belt, One Road initiative that was occurring, uh, focused on the industries of the future, artificial intelligence, published almost five times more the white papers on AI since 2010. And if you visited China during that time, you know, it wasn't just when ChatGPT came out. I mean, they were obsessed by artificial intelligence, you know, for the, for the last 15 years. And then looking at alternative energy, another industry of the future invested more than three X what the United States was able to do. And people said it was the Chinese century. You know, the, the economists said the Chinese century is well underway. Fortune said it's a China world. And then what happened was effectively uh, the train hit the wall. And what really was the catalyst, of course, was COVID. Um, and as we talk about, there was BC before Corona, there's now AD after the disease, with effectively the future accelerating to the present. So BC, it was golden China. China was the golden child, it was the future. Today, people ask if it's broken, child, if it's broken China. And some of the headwinds, you know, you have lockdown PTSD in China. You have the EdTech crackdown, which has been devastating. You have now Xi, who has become the emperor for life, uh, effectively uh, with the, his coronation at the recent Chinese Congress. 
you know, the total fertility rate uh, is, is effectively, China is killing itself. It's 1.1, obviously, just to keep even, you need over, over, over two. You have an aging population. So today, 17% of the Chinese are over the age of 65. By the end of the century, it's going to be nearly 50% of their population. And looking at the number of foreign residents into uh, China, it's about a third of what, you know, India is, able, is, is, is doing. I call it the no mas for elites and entrepreneurs. This was going on for many, many years, but then we all saw when Jack Ma disappeared for, uh, for six months, uh, uh, Kai Fu Li, same thing, where basically people who got too much notoriety in the Chinese government wasn't very positive on that. And you add this all up, and you see you know, China, which was this freight train, effectively has slowed down dramatically in terms of what is taking place. You've had global VC funding cut by two-thirds. And you compare that to what's happened in the last couple of years with India, where you see a, a nearly a 4x increase in the venture capital, you see that something's going on. So we're really set up here, I call it, Shanghai versus Mumbai is a heavyweight battle to see who's going to really lead the future. And so here's the tail of the tape. So demographically, we've got India with a very young population, 26% under the age of 15. Flip side of that, it's, it doesn't have many people over the age of 65. 65 isn't that old, by the way, as we're getting... Uh, you look at college enrollments, um, China is still about double what India is, but you see things shifting very quickly here. But importantly, when you look at the prioritization of education, uh, like China, India spends a, a significant part of supplementary income on, an, on education, about eight times the United States. Unicorn is about three times more in China today, but in education, it's 7x in terms of what India has been able to accomplish. Public market cap, which was really a lagging indicator, is about 4x for China over India. Is, oops. You know, as we've seen this quote numerous times, but I think it is, you know, an interesting or important comment. It's not just India's decade, it's India's century. And, you know, I think it certainly has that type of opportunity, which I'm going to get into in more details, but I think there's some important issues to address. But a lot of times issues or problems create opportunities, but what are some of these challenges? So first, you look at India's GDP per capita of $2,250, but if you take away its top 30 million wealthiest people, it's, it, it, it goes down to $700. Why is that the case? Well, I say there's basically three Indians. You got the Europe India, with a population of 100, million with a GDP per capita is 10,000 or 4x. Then you got the Brazil India with 110 million people with about a $3,000 GDP per capita. Then you got the Africa India with a billion two population and a GDP per capita of just $1,000. Looking at some characteristics of these three Indias, you got the Europe India where English is universal and highly educated. You got the Brazil India where English use is, is partial, and then you got the Africa India where it's non-existent. And we know that mastering English has a huge ROI in terms of its income potential, at least 60%, 7%. We've seen some data that suggests it's much higher than that. What else are some headwinds? The female literacy rate in India is just 66% versus a global average of 80%. More stunning, when you look at uh, in college, 27% per 69%, but I guess this is what I was saying was stunning. When you look at labor force participation with urban females with, um, with an independent income, in China, it's 90%. India, just 7%. So as oil was to the industrial economy, education is to the knowledge economy, and here's where we get some really exciting momentum going. India has 10 million engineers ages 18 to 25. That's 3x China. That's 10 times more than the United States. Since 2008, Indian American child has won every Scripps National Spelling Bee, which is absolutely amazing. 
And what's in, it's, it's what's in the water here. The prioritization, the love, the, 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 real, the real focus on education. You know, you have the major newspapers which write headline articles about students in school and their achievements. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. And again, that suggests sort of what is going on in terms of the emphasis. You look at popular entertainment shows. In America, Shark Tank, they focus on what could be a better sponge. Here it's about a better education. The, the, Indian, the, 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 the Indian diaspora is as large um, globally as is, is, is what China, UK, and the United States has combined. You look at the market cap of Indian-led U.S. public companies, it's two times larger than the Indian overall market cap. And Indians are clearly starting to run Silicon Valley, and they're starting to also run the world. Look at IT grads. I think this is a really important data point. Incredible, because when you look at the hist historically, uh, many, you know, 80% of the top students, the students from IIT, left India to go to international firms in 2001. Today, that's 16, only 16%, meaning they're staying here and creating businesses for the future. Look at the number of startups founded every day in India. And I remember being here in 2016, you could just feel it starting to really happen. At that point, you had 12 startups happen every single day in India. Today, it's 80. Plus, there's a secret weapon for India's rise. What Singapore was to China, Abu Dhabi and Dubai is to India. I call this Abu Dubai. And Abu Dubai is not just the capital of capital, it's really the window to the future. So, you know, from the capital perspective, you know, $1.5 trillion in Abu Dhabi alone with the sovereign wealth funds. Within an eight-hour flight of Abu Dhabi and Dubai, you have 4.3 billion people within an eight-hour flight. You look at 10 years ago in Dubai, you had 1,000 Indian founders. Today, it's estimated that there's over 10,000 that's growing every single day. So now we're going to talk about <coughs> the learning, the, the, talking about some of the themes that we're focused on that we think were the opportunities that can be framed for the future. First, knowledge is a currency. The, the idea that in the old world it was your diploma that was the ticket to that future opportunity that really was key and the more prestigious the university, the bigger the opportunity it was. Today it's about what you know, not where you go. It's about knowledge, not college, and it's th that degree, while not going away, is being augmented by other ways you're able to represent the knowledge that you have, whether it's a certificate, whether it's the experience you have, all this represented in the, in the capabilities that give you an opportunity for the future. Obviously, we've got Emeritus, who is a global leader, you know, creating access to quality education uh, to students to, to, to benefit their future. You got Coursera, that not only has 113 million students on its platform, it has 18 million students in India alone. Degreed, which is used by one in three Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 50 companies, excuse me. Upgrad, over 20, uh, 2 million users. Second theme, RoboEd. This is how artificial intelligence is being integrated into the learning experience. So being a more personalized uh, learning, accelerating where you're proficient, uh, backing you up where, where you're deficient. And again, to how, learning how you best learn yourself. So Learnio, the old course hero, has 115 million pieces of study content. <clears throat> Um, that's available to students. Grammarly has 30 million daily active users. Photomath, where you're able to take your phone, take a picture of a math problem, and instantly not only comes back with the answer, but also the solution for how you get there. And if you need more help, you get your personal AI study buddy that helps you um, learn the problem that you're trying to master. Speak, which has 1.5 billion people trying to learn English that has the opportunity to to, to reach digest.ai, put a tutor, tutor in every uh, student's pocket. Number three theme, autonomous learning. So in the old world, you had just-in-case learning. You learned something just-in-case, somehow, some way you'd actually be able to use it. 
Uh, today, it's about just-in-time learning, being able to learn instantaneously at the place you need to, to have the knowledge to be effective. Companies like iLearning Engines, which is a chat GBT for the enterprise, uh, AI21 Labs, which I just saw in Tel Aviv a couple days ago, absolutely incredible what they're doing, creating personalized learning experience. Gong, which has a 481% return on investment to help salesmen be more effective. Glean, personalized workspace search. Number four theme, higher ed, H-I-R-E, ed. And this is the idea that you're learning something to apply it for an employment opportunity. APNA, with over 200,000 companies working in 74 cities in India. Example is Andela, which has been able to show an 84% increase in income for the people that go through their program, 96% placement rate. Simply Learn, which has 77% of learners reported career benefits. Scalar, an upskilling platform for the top 1% of all software developers. Number five theme, Hollywood meets Harvard. You can't learn anything unless you are engaged. And what Hollywood does an amazing job with is telling stories, engaging its audience, making stars uh, out of, of different actors, and having high quality at low cost through scale. Some examples of Hollywood meets Harvard is Masterclass, Dreamscape Learn, which we have, um, I think you're gonna hear from, maybe I already have, but which was a partnership with Arizona State initially, and we've been fortunate to become an investor in where their median biology lab grade has improved from a B to an A plus. Here's just a quick little clip showing some of this content. As with any ecosystem, the Elorian forest is a complex network in which energy moves from one organism to another. I'm more of a hands-on learner, so this uh, helped me really retain most of the information, and I felt like a true scientist when I wasn't there. It's uh, pretty shocking. I went in expecting something cool. Dope. It's certainly loud. <laughs> Carnegie Learning, which was one of the original AI uh, math companies, uh, recently partnered with James Cameron, doing a project for the classroom, but again, with a Hollywood meets Harvard theme. Invisible Learning, the sixth theme. This is the idea, and it's really a cousin of Hollywood meets Harvard. This is the idea that you're learning something in your natural activity of your life without even really realizing that you're, you're learning. Games is a, is a great example of this. Duolingo, you know, 45 million users in India alone, 10 million were added here in 2022. Kahoot, I think this is a pretty you know, cool fact. It's the second quote unquote coolest brand among Gen Z in Western Europe after Nike. Quiz, 50 million monthly active users. Number seven theme is Web3. And Web3, you know, has got a lot of hype and then a lot of uh, uh, questions about it. But the bottom line, this is coming. It's like gravity and it's, a, it's the natural evolution of the internet. And I think it's very powerful as it relates to the future of learning. And this is gonna be this idea of your physical world and your virtual world effectively blending and becoming uh, seamless. So whether it's the digital wallets, which is going to carry all your digital assets, or whether it's VR and AR, which is going to create a richer, more engaging alternative world, I mean, all this stuff is happening. We're very excited about some of the developments in that space. Some examples, which, you know, Roblox had 50 billion hours spent last year on that platform. Class Dojo, Class Dojo with 50 million students and parents. Replit has 10 million users, 80% international. Prisms, used in 100 plus US schools, all examples of this. A theme, education is a benefit. In the old world, um, not the old world, but in, in the past, healthcare was really a key benefit that had been used to attract and retain key professionals. Increasingly, you're seeing education be used as a key benefit to attract and retain and develop people. Guild, um, education has 3.5 million frontline users work with major corporations around the world. 
in stride, which is a spin out of ASU, uh, has, has the same, same, same concept, work with major corporations. Multiverse, uh, you know, working with, uh, has an 85% completion rate, which is five times higher than MOOCs. Articulate workplace training platform used by 118,000 organizations. Ninth theme, mind, body, and soul. And this is, gets to the whole idea of what an educated person is, what you're trying to, to get in terms of having a fulfilled, purposeful life. That is this integration of different ways that you are uh, living your fullest life. Companies like Mind Valley, 175,000 registered users, open house, eight after school learning spaces across Bangalore and, and Calcutta. Hume, AI for emotional well being. And mark or learning assessments for 20% of students with dyslexia. Last theme ROE equals ROI. And this is our fundamental concept that believes that the companies that have the greatest educational impact are going to have the greatest financial returns. And so there's, and that's frankly uh, consistent with any company that we're looking to, to invest in and partner with. It, you know, the, we look for companies that can truly be transformative in terms of educational impact. Companies like Physics Walla, used by one in five Indian medical students. Example, buys you over 150 million users. Philo, instant live tutoring, less than 60 seconds, getting access to an expert. Class Plus, over 25 million monthly active users. And Lead, again, high quality, low cost, reaching 1.2 million students across 3,000 schools in India. One more thing. We've got to talk about ChatGBT, as everybody is. And ChatGBT, obviously, you know, there's something very special going on. You know, you know something's going on just when you see the sort of the level of activity, which is something that we've never seen in, in history. So it took Airbnb 2.5 years to reach a million users. It took uh, Facebook 10 months to reach a million users. It took Spotify five months to reach a million users. It took Apple with its iPhone 74 days to reach a million users. It took ChatGBT five days to reach a million users. I'm just gonna play a quick little video. Give you a Maverick. 30 plus years of service, combat medals, citations, only man to shoot down three enemy planes in the last 40 years, distinguished, distinguished, distinguished. Yet you can't get a promotion, you won't retire, and despite your best efforts, you refuse to die. You should be at least a two-star admiral by now, if not a senator. Yet here you are, Captain. What is that? It's one of life's mysteries, sir. This isn't a joke. I asked you a question. I want to belong, sir. Well, the Navy doesn't see it that way. Not anymore. These planes you've been testing, Captain. One day, sooner than later, they won't need pilots at all. Pilots that need to sleep, eat, take a piss. Pilots that disobey orders. All you did was buy some time for those men out there. The future is coming, and you're not in it. So that scene doesn't have anything to do with anything, but I just like watching it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but obviously that's, you know, I think the common view is basically that technology is going to be replacing maybe all jobs. What I like to say is a horse that can count to 10 is a remarkable horse, but it's not a remarkable mathematician. And what I mean by that is that as you think about how ChatGBT is going to be applied, I think it's going to be the greatest, you know, trivial pursuit partner that you could ever imagine but it's not going to replace people's ingenuity. The great Sadhguru said, education is about empowerment, about cultivating a human being to the highest possible potential, a tool for fulfilling the immensity of being. So we can 
give a person a fish or we can teach them to fish, but you can't use an old map in a new world. And we're clearly in a new world in terms of where we're heading. So as we wrap up, what I believe the foundation of being an educated person in the future is going to look like is what I call the seven C's, which starts with critical thinking and solving problems. Creativity. It's how do you take and connect dots and think about you know, what the future can be and, and how you create solutions. Communication, whether you're speaking or texting or, or creating, a, creating a presentation, it's how you interact and how you can effectively provide your ideas or, or influence people or, and reach people. Cultural fluency, clearly we're in a global marketplace from a global world and how we understand how other people operate and, and work. Civic engagement, collaboration, how do you work as a team? Character, I mean character, I think increasingly we see how important that is for just not only leadership, but just how you beat families and culture and society. So what I like to talk about, just in closing, you know, in the, in the old world, elite equals scarce. In the new world, elite really equals excellence. In the new old world, cost equal quality. In the new world, it's really outcomes equal quality. In the old world, it was about a calendar that was your progression. In the new world that we're, we're in, the brave new world, it's mastery equals progression. Old world, the school equal, you went to equaled your job options. In the new world, <clears throat> it's about competence equals your job options. In the old world, it's about race and gender that was limited or provided an opportunity for your future. In the new world, it's all about content of character for, for your opportunity. And this is the last point as it relates to the businesses of the future. And I wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Mission Corporation. When we see the great businesses of tomorrow, they're going to have the ambition of a for-profit and the heart of a not-for-profit, combining purpose and profits. And that really is part of this brave new world. So as we think about the last 25 years, it was really about this emergence of China. As we look at the next 75 years, it's all about India. So what we believe is that Indian ed tech companies will power the global knowledge economy and empower the Indian economy. So to close up, as the great Yogi Bear said, when there's a fork in the road, take it. Thank you very much. Let's give it up for Michael Moe, ladies and gentlemen and for Tom Cruise.